those were the men we depended on, but we also uh, uh, tried to see to it that their, what their recommendations were were sound, that they knew what they were talking about, that they weren't just some uh, curbstone opinion. But above all else, it was, uh, I think, the whole strength of America, the strength that's there, and the strength that I think will always be there despite all the uh, guff you read about in the papers and that our, some of our political leaders are talking about that America's sick, that we're guilty of this and that, and I don't know what we're accused of today, but apparently everything that goes wrong uh, in this country, it's somehow it's our fault. It's our fault that we haven't done this for so-and-so. Well, all I can say is uh, Dr. Seaborg and I were both brought up for, for a while. I lived in California, and I think he was brought up there. And uh, we were comparing notes today as to uh, the pay rate for picking fruit in Southern California. I was a little older, so my pay rate was much lower. But uh, for a 12-hour day, uh, it ranged from about 60 cents a day for, for picking grapes up to about a dollar to a dollar and a quarter for picking apricots or prunes. And uh, if you mention a dollar to a small child today, why, well, you know what he'll tell you. <laughs> I'd like to express my real pleasure in being here and seeing so many old friends, and particularly, uh, you didn't think I was a friend, but I really was, <laughs> and uh, uh, because I depended on you and you didn't fail me. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Groves. We're delighted that you could come and see again that place which you started 25 years ago and visit with those people who made it possible. In his coming, I've heard a lot of stories about General Groves, which I won't uh, pass on to you. I'm sure you know the same stories and probably uh, some better. This morning at the press conference with Dr. Seaborg, General Groves, and with Mr. Block and Mr. Williams, Dr. Seaborg, uh, Seaborg presented a very attractive trophy to one of the managers of the contractor groups at Hanford for an accomplishment that I'm sure all of us are proud. I'm particularly proud, principally because of the fact that in my normal work day when I'm not putting on 25th anniversary celebrations, I work for that company, but to Mr. Thomas P. Letty, the ITT FSS president, Dr. Seaborg presented a citation from the Atomic Energy Commission for the one billion passenger miles without an injury to a passenger, which was attained by the ITT FSS bus operations. This record began on July 1, 1952, and was attained on March 25, 1968. A total of 27,516,121 passengers were transported. This is a tremendous achievement, and to Mr. Letty and the employees of the ITTFSS company, certainly, I'm sure, go all of our congratulations. And this is the beautiful trophy which was presented. <laughs> Mr. Letty, will you please stand up? <laughs> we
We just couldn't let that go by, and particularly I couldn't let that go by, because if a guy really needs brownie points, it's now. <laughs> After this week of the very kindness of my immediate boss and my department boss, and the president of the company, well, they're being patient and kind. They at least let me have the opportunity to carry on a little activity this week that uh, perhaps maybe uh, I, may, may, I may pay for later on. I don't know. But let me say this to you before I go any further, that it's a delight for me. It's a privilege. It's an honor, one that has never happened before to me. And I don't suppose that it will ever happen again to be on a platform with as many astute and distinguished gentlemen as are setting up here at this head table. And I certainly feel myself being very privileged. Our next speaker was born in Michigan in 1912, graduated from high school in 1929 as valedictorian of his class. He entered the University of California at Los Angeles and received his Bachelor of Arts degree in chemistry in 1934. In 1937, he received his Doctor of Philosophy degree in chemistry at the same university. During the period of 1937 to 1941, he was co-discoverer of numerous isotopes which later were found to have practical applications in research and medicine. In 1940, he, with E.W. Kennedy, E.W. McMillan, and A.C. Wall, were the co-discoverers of plutonium. In, 19, in April of 1942, he was given a leave of absence from the University of California to head the plutonium, plutonium chemistry work of the Manhattan District Project at the University of Chicago Metallurgical Laboratory. In 1945, he received a full professorship of chemistry at the University of California, and in 1946, he took responsibility for the direction of nuclear chemical research at Lawrence Radiation Laboratories, the University of California, Berkeley. Now, before I go any further, let me interject at this point that although he was a chemist, he had a very dear, sincere interest in sports. He didn't play sports, but he sure did kick them around because he was, for six years, was the representative from the University of California to the, to the Pacific Coast Conference of the colleges on the West Coast and I don't know what implication that has as far as Washington is concerned, but I don't know whether it's good or bad. But if it was bad, we'll give him the, we'll give him the credit. In 1951, he received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry with Dr. E.W. McMillan, and in 1959 was the recipient of the Atomic Energy Commission Enrico Fermi Award. In August 1958, he was appointed chancellor of the University of California, Berkeley, and at that time, they did not have the kind of things that are going on that are going there now. And I'm sure uh, he had some uh, effect on that. On January 21, 1961, he was nominated to the Atomic Energy Commission, and on March 7, 1961, was designated chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission by the late President John F. Kennedy and is presently the chairman of the commission. He is the author of several books on chemistry and elements. He has published approximately 200 scientific papers and is a member of the leading national as well as international scientific society. He is married. He has six children. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to present to you Dr. Glenn T. Seaborg. Dr. Seaborg.
Chairman Beardsley, Mayor Claggett, General Groves, and honored guests and ladies and gentlemen. I am glad that your chairman made it uh, reasonably clear that I left my position as the Chancellor of the University of California at Berkeley voluntarily. <laughs> I don't know whether I'm equally glad that he uh, took note of my uh, role as the faculty athletic representative uh, representing the University of California in the Pacific Coast Intercollegiate Athletic Conference in view of what befell the University of Washington, the University of Southern California, the University of California at Los Angeles, and really my own university, the University of California at Berkeley, for it was really during my tenure as the faculty athletic representative that the Pacific Coast Conference disintegrated and disappeared. <laughs> General Groves, I do want to indicate that uh, I appreciated uh, very much your remarks uh, this evening, and I do agree with you wholeheartedly in the role that the chemist played in the Manhattan Project. <laughs> now, before I begin my remarks, I would like to make a few comments in a very serious vein. I am glad that uh, Father Sweeney and Mayor Claggett took notice of the tragic events of the last few days. It's uh, a very sad event indeed, a tragic event, and uh, uh, one which we all deplore. Senator Robert F. Kennedy was a good friend of mine, as he was really of us all. But as terrible as the immediate memory of the recent assassination is, I know that Senator Kennedy would have desired that we continue with our observation of the 25th anniversary of Hanford tonight, the place that played such an important role in ending the hostilities in the Second World War, putting an end there to violence and bloodshed, which Dr. Uh, which uh, the Senator uh, so wished for in these days. Now I'm going to uh, speak more uh, with respect to the future uh, of Hanford and. Uh, of uh, the things that uh, took place here at Hanford and uh, only to a slight extent in a retrospective vein. Uh, I have uh, prepared remarks in which I do include uh, some reminiscences uh, of my early contacts with Hanford, but in view of the time, I won't uh, give you all of that material, but suggest that uh, uh, the prepared text can be made available to those of you who would like to see it from uh, uh, Don Williams, if you uh, will arrange that. My own association with the site of the Hanford Engineer Works uh, dates back to sometime in 19... 44. From many standpoints, it was apparent that uh, General Groves and his staff and Crawford H. Greenwald and his DuPont engineers had chosen well in the matter of this site. But in addition, it was apparent that they were wasting no time in turning this lonesome expanse into a beehive of special activity. And at the Hanford camp during my first visit, 
I saw rows of barracks and tents and trailers stretched in all directions and as uh, has been previously indicated, a camp of uh, teeming activity uh, accommodating the requirements of some 50,000 construction employees. Certainly I was impressed with the scope of the project and it was all the more amazing when, cons when one considered its purpose to, uh, to conduct large-scale alchemy. Here we were going to produce kilogram amounts of a new element, which only a few months before we had just been able to isolate in a weighable quantity. Now looking back on the history of Hanford, there is so much to indicate that in a sense it was a remarkable act of faith and a result of the determination and courage of many men. And I wish there were time to mention all their names and give each individual the credit that is due. If we consider the future production of this element and compare these projected amounts with those involved in the very first tracer studies of the chemistry of plutonium, the scale up is even greater than that that I mentioned this afternoon. We were then considering uh, when the element was first discovered and we worked with tracer amounts, uh, quantities measured in picogram amounts, 10 to the minus 12 grams. And uh, we are now thinking in terms of the future production of the element plutonium in terms of hundreds of metric tons. The scale up thus will amount to about 10 to the 20th power, a number more meaningful to astrophysicists than to chemists. And of course, this scale up possibility is due to plutonium's unique promise of service to mankind. As used in breeder reactors, it will be the fuel of the future and it will serve as an energy source in devices ranging from a surgically implanted artificial heart to scientific and life-supporting units in space. In fact, there has been some talk that the future value of plutonium may someday make it a, a logical contender to replace gold as the standard of our monetary system. That would be a great day for Hanford. However, not being an economist, I'll not try at this time to predict how we would operate under this new plutonium standard. I'll make only one more reminiscence uh, about the early days before I go into a consideration of the future. I recall that it was during my second trip here in December 1944 that uh, we were asked to sign the numerous specifications for the bismuth phosphate process, which was to be operated in the just completed first chemical separation plant. This was amazingly only 18 months after the historic decision uh, to adopt the bismuth phosphate process uh, for the separation here. And equally amazing was the rate at which the chemical separation plant went into operation. We received the operating standards on December 15th, 1944. The first production run of Hanford material in this chemical separation plant began nine days later, December 26th, 1944. And in less than two months, February 2nd, 1945, the first delivery of plutonium was made from Hanford to the Los Alamos Laboratory. Now, as I think back to the Hanford Richland area of 25 years ago and compare it to what we see here today, I am reminded of many changes in uh, the situation as it exists today. Richland has changed in many ways since that time. Now, some people might say that today's Richland is, represented, is representative of the town 
that science built. I would go one f uh, step further and say it represents the human bonus that results, fr uh, that results from our nuclear age endeavors, a type of spin-off for people which goes with our technological progress. I am pleased to say that the atom has been responsible for some healthy and ha happy communities, and Richland is certainly among the foremost of them. Of course, no small credit for this is due to your enlightened and enterprising community leaders, your Mayor Claggett and uh, Councilman Beardsley and your public officials and your regional organizations such as the Tri-Cities Nuclear Council and certainly your fine senators Warren Magnuson and Henry Jackson and your outstanding Congresswoman Mrs. Catherine May, who have always worked so hard in your behalf. All their efforts in cooperation with private industry and the federal government have set the pattern for making Richland a city of the future. And I believe that the changes that have been fostered here are the results of the kind of thinking and long-range planning that's going to be essential in, in our country in the coming years when rapid economic and social change must take place to meet our national needs. But returning to the broader aspects of our celebration today, what have all these pioneering years of Hanford and Richland seen? And to what overall effort have they contributed? They've contributed far more than the massive production of a new chemical element and the technologies and the spin-off associated with it. I believe they have seen the evolution of a new age, the full possibilities of which are, we are now only beginning to realize. The great potential power stoked forth from the nuclear furnaces of Hanford is now becoming the fire of the future. And it's a type of fire that will bring more people not only physical comforts through heat and light and power and water and food, just to uh, mention a few of the benefits, but a large measure of added knowledge and understanding. The greater significance behind the large-scale alchemy which has taken place at Hanford is that of being able to bring forth changes in the lives of people and the healthy growth of their communities through scientific and technological changes. It also involves the future production of energy on such a grand scale and hopefully so cheaply that we may well see, as I will point out in a moment, an era when such a material as plutonium will radically change our relationship to almost all other materials, to our production of food, and the use we make of our water and air and minerals and our other natural resources. So I'd like to spend the next few minutes exploring the role that nuclear energy might play during the next 25 years or so, and perhaps well into the next century in changing our lives and advancing the lives of our children. I will not go into the statistics of today's nuclear power growth, mainly because they change almost as fast as we can attempt to report them. There's no doubt that nuclear power as a means of generating electricity has reached and in fact has passed what some economists call the takeoff point. It's being accepted for economic reasons. It's being accepted for environmental reasons, and it is being accepted for aesthetic as well as for practical reasons. The time is not far off when clean, compact, competitive nuclear plants will be the conventional power plants of the day. But being conventional is not the goal of most of us interested in nuclear power, and far from it. We look forward and are working and planning accordingly to the day when abundant, versatile, and very economic nuclear power together with other technological advances that are taking place, 
will make possible a new era of human progress. This can take place on many levels and in many ways. The changes that will be wrought by nuclear power are, of course, dependent on far-sighted economic and environmental thinking. And in this respect, we in the nuclear age have a decided advantage over previous generations. We have had the opportunity of planning well. Fortunately, our nuclear age is one of foresight as well as power, and there, therefore we're thinking in terms of conserving our energy resources and of using them as efficiently and economically as possible and of their relationship with all our other resources and our total environment. This new level of thinking is perhaps the most significant phenomenon that has taken place paralleling our current technological revolution. As a result, in the nuclear field, we are not content to sit back and watch the growing use of our present range of nuclear power stations. No matter how safe and reliable and economically competitive they may be today and for the coming decade or so, but we are already very hard at work developing the more efficient converter reactors and the breeder reactors of the future, which will allow us to make far more efficient and economic use of our natural nuclear resources. And here is where Richland comes so substantially into the picture. Richland, of course, will be highly involved in the development of an important kind of breeder reactor, the FAST breeder, as the FAST fuels test facility will be located here. And this facility, which will play a vital role in the development of the FAST breeder through the testing of its fuels and materials, is an example of how nuclear development can bring additional growth to a community. Now, to what extent and in what ways might the growth of nuclear power affect our total progress? At first, through the fullest use of our current reactors, and eventually through that of reactors such as the fast breeder. And the secret lies not just in producing abundant and cheap energy, but in thinking of it and using it as a raw material to affect the use of other materials and our environment. Energy has always played this role to some extent, and this is one reason why our cities and industrial centers have grown and prospered on the large waterways and at the rail centers where they could be supplied easily with fuel. But we have nuclear energy at a time when we also benefit from a new level of sophistication in chemical and industrial engineering and in agricultural development and in environmental planning. And therefore, we can work toward using nuclear energy in combination with these other factors to perform some momentous tasks. At the same time, the possibilities ahead give us enormous incentive to reduce the cost of nuclear power to levels where it will greatly increase its use and effectiveness. For example, we know that at a certain cost, nuclear power makes it economical to desalt large amounts of seawater in conjunction with generating substantial amounts of electricity. At a similar cost range, the economic production of large amounts of fertilizer becomes feasible and can, can be used in combination with fresh water and electricity. And in still other ranges of reduced costs, a cumulative number of industrial processes becomes possible, ranging from the making of steel by electric furnace methods through the manufacture of magnesium at today's cost of aluminum down to the production of pipeline gas from coal. And at the very low end of this decreasing cost scale, we may someday see the use of nuclear power for general purpose uh, heat or uses such as the manufacture of gasoline from coal. And in this range, for which the cost of power would have to come down to as low as one mil per kilowatt hour, and there are those 
experts who believe that this will be possible in the future, all sorts of industrial miracles become possible. Now, to project some of the possibilities which nuclear energy offers at various economic levels, uh, we need to be bold in our thinking. There is a combination, for example, in which nuclear energy can make contributions to the coastal desert areas of the world, large regions located on tropical seacoasts in several parts of the world. These areas, for the most part, now unpopulated and unproductive, might prove to be valuable sources of food and other products if the right combination of nuclear energy and human ingenuity can be brought to bear. From studies that were originated by Dr. R. Philip Hammond at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and vigorously advanced by Dr. Alvin Weinberg, director of the laboratory, has come the idea of constructing large nuclear-powered agro-industrial complexes on such desert areas. These uh, uh, complexes using large reactors, even of the types currently under construction today, but of course better when the breeder comes along, would be used to desalt seawater in quantities of several hundred millions of gallons per day and to provide the power to produce large quantities of ammonia and phosphorus fertilizer as well as all other electricity to operate the complex and its community. This power and water and fertilizer would support the operation of a large, highly scientific farm, a food factory as we are coming to call it, which would be growing very high yield crops, specially bred for the area's soil and climatic conditions. An extensive study has been made of this concept by a team comprised of outstanding scientists and engineers and economists and other experts in uh, uh, various disciplines, and their findings indicate that such agro-industrial complexes could produce tremendous quantities of food on hitherto unproductive land. The results of this study will soon be released by the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, so I will not uh, go into the details on it. But I would like to point out other ramifications of this plan. And this again involves extending the use of the technology which you at Hanford have helped to develop, have helped to bring into being and put to work for maximum future use. For example, the nuclear plant of this complex could produce many other chemical byproducts from the brine resulting from the distillation of the seawater. Naturally, an undertaking of this scope is a mammoth one requiring extensive financing and probably significant international cooperation. And perhaps these centers could be focal points of such international cooperation and operated under the aegis of an organization such as the International Atomic Energy Agency and financed by the World Bank. Incidentally, both of these organizations have examined this concept and expressed some interest in it, even at this early stage. Another idea involving the future application of nuclear power on such a large scale is one that I've spoken about on a number of occasions and uh, which is perhaps even a little bit more imaginative than the examples I've already mentioned. This is cast a little further into the future than the previous ideas as it's dependent on very cheap nuclear power such that could only be available from the very large breeder reactors uh, of the future, probably uh, operating in the multi-thousand megawatt, multi-million kilowatt range. Also, this concept would be most applicable to more heavily industrialized uh, countries such as the United States. 
Essentially, it's the concept of basing heavy industry around a very large nuclear power facility, which would act as the complex's energy heart. This processing and manufacturing center would become a nuclear-powered industrial complex, or as we have been referring to it, a nuplex. There are substantial economic and an environmental advantages to be gained from the nuplex concept, particularly if the cost of the nuclear power is low enough to produce large amounts of electricity and process heat very cheaply and put them to a variety of uses. In addition, in addition to processing many conventional resources by new methods, which would reduce their cost, and being able to produce new and more exotic materials, different uh, new metal alloys and ceramics and plastics, and even transuranium elements in large amounts, the nuplex would give us the advantage of being able to recycle most of our waste on an economic basis. This is becoming increasingly important when the disposal of our output of junk and garbage is becoming a problem of major proportions. When the economic recycle of most waste becomes possible, we will alleviate the problems involved in the burning of trash and the flushing of industrial waste into our waterways or finding adequate sites for landfill operations. There is also the added factor that these recycled materials will become more and more valuable as our industrial civilization expands and we must search farther and dig deeper for new material resources. Of course, the nuplex concept has the additional feature of potentially radically improving our urban development. Not only would it give us a literally junkless society, but it would allow us to separate our heavy industry from our cities so that we could plan and build cities designed for the ultimate in healthy living. The, nu the nuplex would be the source of our power and our products, and the city would once again become a place primarily for people. Now these concepts, based on the extensive use of nuclear power, are of course only a part of our possible nuclear future. I've really only touched on one aspect of it, and that is the use of nuclear energy to develop electricity and heat with their uh, manifold potential applications. The role of nuclear energy on and under the sea and its use as a source of power in remote, inhospitable areas of the Earth, its varied applications in space, both in satellites that will give us greater knowledge about the Earth and in nuclear-powered projects that will see us colonize the moon and explore the distant planets. All these are among the other possibilities which are evolving in part from the large-scale alchemy that was begun here in Hanford and Richland 25 years ago. And there's the expanding role of radioisotopes in medicine and agriculture and industry made possible by the tremendous source of radioisotopes that we have through the use of nuclear reactors. And there is also an entire new range of knowledge about man and his origins and his history and his environment that is growing from the use of the atom as an investigative tool. And still we continue to explore the atom itself and learn more about the structure of its nucleus, giving us clues to the structure of our universe. So in conclusion, perhaps 25 years from now, we will be able to gather here to look back over a half century of progress of our nuclear age. By then, Richland, together with the Tri-Cities area, will probably be a large metropolis thriving on its growing science-based industries. Perhaps Hanford will be its nuplex, able to preserve the surrounding vast and majestic area close to the way that nature created it. 
and we will be able to reminisce about the beginning of the nuclear age while we see all about us many of the wonders that it has brought and continues to unfold. And in the meantime, I think that all the citizens of Richland and those who helped to make history at Hanford can be justifiably proud today. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Groves. I only wish I could say that I hope that, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Seaborg. Well, I'm entitled to one. <laughs> I only hope that 25 years from now that, Dr. Seaborg, you can come back and reminisce with us on what you've had to say to us tonight and hope that this becomes the possibility. <clears throat> and now then, for a brief presentation, I'd like to call back on Mayor Claggett. Fred? I, uh, I think I should say at this point to you ladies and gentlemen that uh, the best we can say, the hour is late and so forth, but uh, after all, we don't celebrate a 25th anniversary every year. So with your small indulgence, I would like to uh, make a couple of presentations. First, we would like to assure that uh, uh, our speakers this evening have something else beside our construction activities to remember. We would like to have them take something back with them physically. First for General Grove. Uh, you can break these open now. Wait, he's done. One is uh, to represent the silver anniversary, and the other is uh, for Richmond. Dr. Seaboard. <coughs> Yes. <laughs> Thank you. What? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> you, you, you can go ahead and open them. So, 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 so that we can show, we, so, so that you can show the uh, people what, what's here. <clears throat> I would also like to take this opportunity. You know, the privilege doesn't come very frequently. In fact, I've been looking for it for a while. We here are very grateful for the efforts of a particular organization which has done much for our community. There's a couple of guys in the audience I'd like to call forward at this point. <clears throat> uh, Glenn Lee and Sam Walthamtest. Will you uh, come up here to the front? The city government and the citizens of Richland, it's my privilege as the titular head of the community, so to speak, to you two fellows, present this which is not silver, it simply simulates silver, but, what, but what really is to indicate our genuine feeling with respect to the efforts of your organization for this community. This reads, presented to the Tri-City Nuclear Industrial Council in gratitude for their contributions to the economic development of the city of Richland and the Tri-City area. Presented on the 25th anniversary of Richland, Washington, in behalf of the city council and city of the citizens of Richland, Fred Claggett, Mayor. <clears throat> My congratulations to you. guys live in Richland, and I think this is a, uh, uh, a symptom, shall we say, maybe that's the wrong word, anyway, an indication of what lies ahead for the community. 
Here are two fellows who live in Kennewick who really themselves and through their organization have made a great contribution to our community. One last indulgence, if you will, please. I have one here. Would you stand, Mr. Beardsley? <coughs> This, this is from me to you, it says, sincere gratitude, presented an appreciation of the effective leadership and tireless efforts he has contributed to the success of the 25th anniversary of Richmond, Washington. Members of the city council, city staff, and Richmond citizens, Mayor Fred Claggett to Paul P. Beardsley, general chairman. Paul. <laughs> We hope that those will find a useful place. We hope that you will not forget that Richland is here by the plaque with the city seal on it. And you can remember us, hopefully, <clears throat> when the budget cut comes, <laughs> too. <laughs> And those are not gratuities for that purpose. <laughs> now then, ladies and gentlemen, for all the things that have gone on, and I regret very much to not be able to present to you the guy that I think has done a tremendous job to make it possible for us to be here, the genial new manager of the River Shore Motor Inn, who worked all night long and all day long, and I sent word that I wanted Tom to be present because I wanted you to know who he was, and Mr. Zarelli, the owner-operator of the Merritt Company, for all they've done to make it possible for us to have this lovely place to have these kinds of things in, I think all of us could probably, uh, and I won't ask you to, but we should probably rise and give these people a tremendous hand of applause for the beautiful job that they've done to make it possible in three weeks for us to be here tonight. And I would the Richland join Junior Women's Club, we want to thank very much for serving as hostesses the Richland Garden Club for the beautiful flowers, and these are all homegrown flowers on the tables. And I don't believe many of you saw, but at the back of the room, there are two gorgeous bouquets, courtesy of Arlene's flowers to the city and the people of Richland, to the Richland Junior Chamber of Commerce, for putting up our signs and who will have the historical booklets on sale out in the lobby as you leave tonight, to Dr. George Garlic, to Dr. Dwayne Clayton and the Atlantic Rich Richfield Hanford Company and the Center for Graduate Study for their help in the joint sponsorship of the science colloquium that was held last night to Mr. Frank Millspaw and to Mr. Wally Bardsley of the Sterling Theaters for the use of the Uptown Theater for last evening's colloquium. To our very good friends and those that helped tremendously, the Tri-City Nuclear Industrial Council for their co-hosting this, this banquet and reception. And believe me, last but by no means least, the people who made it possible from the Atomic Energy Commission, the contractors particular, to the Richland Junior Chamber of Commerce for putting up our signs and who will have the historical booklets on sale out in the lobby as you leave tonight, to Dr. George Garlic, to Dr. Dwayne Clayton and the Atlantic Rich Richfield Hanford Company and the Center for Graduate Study for their help in the joint sponsorship of the science colloquium that was held last night. To Mr. Frank Millspaw and to Mr. Wally Bardsley of the Sterling Theater for the use of the Uptown Theater for last evening's colloquium. To our very good friends 
and those that helped tremendously, the Tri-City Nuclear Industrial Council, for their co-hosting this, ban this banquet and reception. And believe me, last but by no means least, the people who made it possible from the Atomic Energy Commission, the contractors, particularly Dr. Harrington and the Douglas United Nuc Nuclear Company, and to Dr. Richards and the Atlantic Hanfield or the Atlantic Richfield Hanford Company, too many names, for their tremendous presentations today in the plant, and to all of the other contractors who supported them in doing this and making it all possible. And I would like to make a very special thank you to Don Williams and his staff, and particularly to my very good and close friend that worked with me uh, very, very hard to make it possible for all of this, to Milt Seidel and his staff in the Office of Information for the tremendous help they've given toward putting this together, to General Grove, to Dr. Seaborg for taking the time from their busy, busy schedules to be here to help us celebrate this 25 years, to all the guests that have come from out of town to be with us tonight and today, and to all of you Richlanders, thank you for the warm hospitality that you have given us tonight and shown to all our guests. This concludes our program. Thank you and good night.